Okay, yeah, so I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to this stimulating workshop. I'll be talking about heavy solitons in a fermionic superfluid. So I'll explain what this means, but this is actually a soliton propagating in a, a fermionic uh, superfluid. Uh, the system in which we do this is a, a spin one-half gas of lithium-6 uh, fermions with strong interactions. And um, probably many of you know the story that we can tune the interactions between spin up and spin down at will, um, pretty much going from uh, the regime of a Bose-Einstein condensate of molecules at low temperatures uh, through a crossover superfluid into the regime where pairing is a many-body affair um, uh, described by the BCS uh, theory. So we know for, for uh, quite a while now that this gas uh, can become superfluid at low temperatures. Um, here we, uh, I, I show the uh, demonstration of superfluidity by rotation, uh, showing this quantized vortex lattice. And so that tells us, aha, so this system of particles has uh, now, um, uh, has now all decided to become waves uh, that you can then observe in, in a single shot of the uh, experiment. But of course, uh, if you have many waves, uh, we all know there's a, a, a duality that we have to pay attention to. We can actually take these waves and make particles out of them. And uh, these particles uh, deserve uh, their own effective mass, m star, their own energy, e star. And of course, that's the concept between all kinds of effective particles in physics, Landau, Landau's quasar particles, the Higgs boson, uh, polarons, even cosmic strings if you want, the vortices that you, that you have seen on the previous slide. And well, this talk will be about solitons. So, uh, of course, these guys are uh, known in many different fields of physics. Whenever you have a nonlinear wave equation where the uh, nonlinearity compensates for the dispersion that you normally get, uh, then you can, have, you can build these solitonic waves that propagate for, actually, in the case of water, for kilometers through narrow canals, um, uh, as, as seen, for example, here. Um, apparently, you get it also in air. I must admit, I've never seen this. This is beautiful, but the, the internet knows it. Um, you can also build it, build it at home. Yeah, it's not dangerous, so, so please go ahead. Um, this is a wonderful solitonic wave uh, on coupled pendulums. And of course, you have it in uh, optics, uh, propagating through fibers solitonic uh, modes of the electromagnetic field. Uh, in superfluids, uh, what's the story? It's very, very similar. A superfluid is described by one complex uh, wave function. Uh, so, psi of x, what you have to do to make a soliton then is to just take the wave function and twist its phase on one side of the superfluid by 180 degrees or something on that order. Um, and then that's what forms uh, a soliton. You get in the case of 180 degrees, you get an exact zero crossing here. The wave function square shows you this, this uh, wonderful uh, dip that goes to zero, and uh, that's what a soliton is. Now, in weakly interacting Bose gases, our paradigmatic example of superfluids, um, we know what equation describes these superfluids, so we have a wonderful model system uh, given by the solutions of this Gross-Bedevsky equation, where here you have the dispersion, and here the nonlinearity from the interactions that can uh, keep the soliton together as one uh, propagating wave. So indeed, this equation has a wonderful solution, the hyperbolic tangent of x uh, having minus something on one side of your uh, box, for example, and plus something on the other side going through zero. And the uh, density profile, in the case of weakly interacting both gases, uh, is directly given by the square modulus of the wave function, so indeed the density just goes to zero exactly uh, in this case of a soliton with a 180 degrees phase shift on either side. So that makes it, so to speak, easy to observe because as you make this pi phase shift, and there are ways to do this that I will explain in the following, uh, you can actually just take a picture of your gas of, of bosons and then see indeed that there are dark stripes appearing in, in this um, condensate. In fact, these dark stripes most often start to move because you're most often not able to imprint a perfect pi phase shift that would correspond to a standstill soliton, but a little bit less or a little bit more than pi, which actually corresponds to a soliton where it's not quite perfect. You cannot quite draw it on a 
the real plane, there is a little bit of a complex part to it. So the density doesn't go quite to zero, and it actually has some um, velocity corresponding to the gradient in the phase across it. So that's why you see these solitons most often propagated. So there are these wonderful experiments uh, from 14 years ago um, in the group of Klaus Sengstock and, and Bill Phillips where they have seen these solitonic waves. Um, these solitons, as I promised, are really effective particles. So they have their own life, meaning they have their own effective mass, and therefore they must also be able to propagate um, uh, like an effective particle in these trapped gases. So of course our atoms are trapped in roughly harmonic traps, so, so they of course feel a trapping potential and would happily oscillate back and forth, but the soliton also, it's an effective particle, it also oscillates back and forth through this Bose-Einstein condensate, and um, this has been observed just a few years ago in, in these Bose-Einstein condensates. It was possible to see full periodic oscillations of the solitons in the Bose-Einstein condensate moving back and forth inside the, inside the condensate. So now, of course, the big question is, what is the period? And naively, you might think, OK, um, the soliton apparently looks like it's a lot of missing particles. So the, uh, the force that is acting on that soliton is simply given by how many missing particles you have times the force that is acting on each of these missing particles, which is negative of the force that, that would act on particles. Right? So that would be the force. And um, the inertia of that soliton, naively, you would say, is also given just by the, the mass that's missing there. So you would conclude that the period is just exactly the same as the period for bare atoms, one times the trapping period for bare atoms. Turns out that's not true. It's observed that the period is squared of two times the trapping period. And that means the solitons have actually an effective mass, m star, which is two times the bare mass. Now, where does that come from? Why is it two times and not one times the bare mass? That comes from the fact that um, across the soliton, you have a phase slip, a phase difference, delta phi. And that means there must be a gradient of the phase across the soliton. A gradient of the, of the phase means you have a superfluid velocity that has to move through the soliton. And that means it carries momentum. Now, how does the momentum depend on this velocity? That tells you the effective mass of the soliton. And it turns out not to be one, but two times the bare mass. It all follows from the Gross-Kudevsky equation. It's a beautiful, magical thing. You can just do it at home, uh, like a piece of paper. Um, and it's, it's awesome. So now, what's the news in uh, fermionic superfluid? Uh, well, uh, the simple picture is, is here. Um, you have now no longer, you're not, no longer calling the wave function psi, but you call it delta. Why? Because in barry cooper schrieffer superfluidity, the order parameter of this gas is now given by the pairing gap, delta. So, but that's, that's just a letter. That doesn't mean things are different. It's still a wave function. It's still a complex wave function. And of course, you can still make a twist. You can still have it go through zero. Now, what is the difference in a fermionic superfluid? Well, you can have particles, Andreev bound states trapped inside the soliton. They love to sit here because that's where the gap goes through zero. So it doesn't cost any pairing energy to sit there. So these Andreev bound states love to, love to sit inside the soliton. So you already get the inkling that when you have such a soliton, there will be these Andreev bound states sitting there. So probably the soliton is getting heavier. Maybe that might be uh, the intuition that that's actually uh, correct, but it's, as I'll show, I guess, in this talk, uh, uh, quite complicated. Um, to understand a little bit more mathematically what is going on, let's just look at BCS pairing. Um, for that, I have to uh, figure out how particles uh, team up with holes to form um, effective quasi-particles, Bogoyubov modes, that then give me uh, uh, my, uh, my paired state, spin up with momentum k, pairing up with spin down momentum minus k. So I draw um, the particles, dispersion relation p squared over 2m, I draw the hole, 
dispersion relation P squared over 2m with the opposite sign, and the difference here is the, given by the, just the chemical potential. And then in atomic physics, we know what will happen now. You get an avoided cross. That species is pairing, nothing else. So now it's, of course, very tempting to just look inside here, very close to this avoided crossing. There, locally, it looks like a delta function, right? Uh, uh, so delta, delta, um, the Dirac, um, uh, Dirac equation, where you have a linear dispersion for left and right moving uh, particles and holes that are coupled to each other by an effective mass, which is provided by the pairing gap. So that's actually a very useful description for uh, BCS pairing. Uh, First, I, I give you the real story, which is usually written down as the Bogu of the equations, uh, where you have, again, uh, dispersion, uh, the kinetic energy, now measured relative to the chemical potential of the, uh, the gas. Uh, that sits on the diagonals of your uh, matrix describing the coupling of particles and holes, so that's why it's just multiplied by sigma z. And the gap here, that is coupling particles and holes, so it looks like a sigma x uh, operator. And uh, now what I want to try is put this spatially varying gap that has a zero crossing into my volume of the equations you know, in some finite system and just solve it on, with Mathematica. And um, uh, I'm very proud you get these points, these energies as a function of momentum. And if you look closely, wait, there are two guys there. Uh -huh very close to the to zero, which here means the chemical potential, those are the Andreev bound states that sit inside the soliton. If I just plot them, um, that's how they look like. Uh, they have these ripples because they live at the momentum given roughly by the Fermi momentum, so that's why they have these fast ripples given, given by the interparticle spacing. But they also have this wonderful envelope, which is given by uh, uh, how fast the gap, the order parameter, is changing in space which is given by the coherence length, the BCS coherence length, something like the healing length in both Einstein and Collins states. So we have these two guys indeed. There are these uh, trapped particles. This is, by the way, of course, in one dimension. And now in three dimensions, you can imagine you have a whole plane of these Andreev bound states where your soliton sits. So it's a whole two-dimensional plane in your three-dimensional superfluid filled with these Andreev bound states. The energy, by the way, uh, goes in the BCS limit like delta squared over 2e Fermi, so it's much smaller than the gap itself, delta. Uh, so these are called in-gap states. There is an even simpler description of what's going on when I uh, neglect these fast variations, or, or actually I, I take out these fast oscillations that I, that I anyways uh, know that are there, and just go directly to my Dirac equation picture where I have these linear these dispersing modes. Uh, now, my kinetic energy is only contained in this linear um, operator, this uh, single derivative with respect to space on the diagonal. I've taken out the fast oscillating term um, in my quasiparticle operators that oscillates at this interparticle spacing. I don't want that. And what's left is still, of course, my mass, my effective mass, which is here this, this pairing gap, which is, again, coupling particles and holes. So this equation has a beautiful history. It's a Dirac equation, okay, um, with a spatially varying mass. And you might think uh, no one in, in particle physics should have ever thought about that because why do you get a spatially varying mass? That is crazy. Um, but it turns out, I don't know why, but these guys figured it out. Jakif and Rebbe solved this problem with the Dirac equation and the spatially varying mass and figured out that, yes, there are again bound states sitting inside the soliton. So here's, here's your spatially varying mass. Here's the square of the spatially varying mass, and it effectively produces an effective potential on quasi-particles that makes these guys bound. So those are, again, these Andreev bound states that I had before. In this um, limit, where the equation here is called Andreev equation, the, the energy of these guys is vanishingly small, essentially zero. And Jakif and Rebbe figured out that the particle number that's carried by these bound states is exactly one half. Bizarre story, the first example of fractionalization in, in physics. Um, and it later came up in the description of polymers, one-dimensional polymers, uh, described by the so-called Sue Schriever Hega model, which, by the way, is just the discretization, discrete version of this continuous 
Dirac equation. So just to tell you that it's, there's a beautiful number of connections between solitons and fermionic superfluids, uh, quantum field theory, and even polymers in 1D. It's all the same story. It's just this Dirac equation. Uh, now, how about the mass, right? Uh, what about this effective mass in the BCS limit? In the Bose case, we kind of understood it now. Um, at least within factors of two, our naive uh, estimate was kind of OK. Now, in the BCS limit, um, at the location of the zero of my gap, I will not have a zero of my density, right? Because the only thing that goes down to zero as my gap, my wave function goes to zero, is the Cooper pairs. The Cooper pairing vanishes inside the soliton. But of course, most of the gas is not affected by that. Cooper pairing only takes place in a narrow sliver around the Fermi surface. Roughly a fraction of delta over E Fermi of the particles takes part in the Cooper pairing. So only those guys are gone, and all the rest is still there. So that means the density of the soliton will not go to zero. It will actually be rather filled with stuff, with normal fluid. And only these guys here, this narrow sliver here, is, is missing. So that tells me now, aha, uh -huh, the bare mass of my soliton in the BCS limit should now be just those guys that are missing, which is the number of Cooper pairs, which is delta over E Fermi times the, the, the number I would normally have inside the soliton times the bare mass. Again, it's negative, of course, because they're missing. So that's the bare mass. Now, what about the inertial mass? Here, that was the complicated story that I tried to explain. You have a phase shift across the soliton. That means there must be a gradient in the phase across the soliton. That means there must be a superfluid flow through the soliton. And uh, indeed, that carries then a momentum. So the momentum is simply just the integral of all the superfluid velocity, that's of course the density and the mass, which is the integral over the gradient of the phase. Oh well, so it's just related to the phase difference on, the both, si on both sides of the soliton. So now to figure out what the effective inertial mass of the soliton is, we will need to know how this momentum depends on velocity, which means we will need to know how this phase gradient depends on the velocity of the soliton. Turns out that's not exactly known. Uh, there are calculations, for example, in this, um, in this paper, um, how the phase actually depends on the soliton velocity. But you see, it's not, you know, I don't think the last word has been <laughs> said about this relationship, the phase velocity relationship. But what they roughly see here is that um, the, the phase uh, versus velocity for very low velocities is roughly linear with the slope that is well more or less given by the, the speed of sound in this PCS superfluid, which uh, uh, has nothing else in it than the interparticle spacing, h bar, and m. So if you believe me then that I kind of looked over this for a while and, and uh, thought about it, I read from this graph that the difference in the effective mass to the bare mass is roughly given by all the guys that can sit inside the soliton times the bare mass. So that's all the particles, not just the, the missing ones, everyone. So that figure is a uh, PTS, is a uh, paper? Yeah. And how they, they, saw, they get it by BDG? Yeah. Uh -huh. okay. So this is using the BDG. Uh -huh. So I should actually say, in the strongly interacting regime, all bets are off because we do not know what the wave equation actually is, right? We know it in the BCS limit, or we trust that the Beaulieu of Dijen theory is perfect. Uh, in the BEC limit, we know it's the Grosbedevsky equation, but in the strong interacting regime, all bets are off. And of course, we can try the Beaulieu of Dijen theory even on resonance, but mm, quantitatively, it might be quite off. Yeah. Can I just ask what the dotted line is? Um, that is a very good question um, that I don't remember what the answer is. So I know these, these uh, red, green, and blue situations are for different interaction strengths. Um, so I'm pretty sure the dotted line is for the BEC limit, where you have an analytic solution between the gradient across the, 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 the phase difference across the soliton and the velocity normalized by the speed of sound, which is just given by the cosine of delta phi over 2. That's just the velocity. So I'm, uh, let's say, 99, well, 100% sure that this is 
this is what the dashed line is, that's the BEC limit, and then the red, green, and blue are weaker and weaker, well, interactions that go closer and closer to the BCS limit, where you see there is apparently a second velocity scale that comes into play, which is the pair breaking velocity, in addition to the speed of sound in the, in the gas. The complex story, and I don't think this story is settled, so please go ahead and do it. But so if that story has you know, some validity, I can, I can immediately say the effective mass normalized by the bare mass is going to be exponentially large. Because I have n guys sitting there in my soliton contributing to the inertial mass, effectively everyone has to move through the soliton, not just the, the bare guys. Uh, but the bare guys only are a fraction of delta over e Fermi. So I get an enhancement e Fermi over delta of my effective mass, and therefore a period increase which goes like this, the square root of that. So that's what I uh, uh, expect. And indeed, that's what uh, Stringari, Pijewski, and, and company uh, found from their volume of the Gen calculations. Um, they found that these solitons really get slower as you go from the BEC regime to the BCS regime. It starts out roughly at square root of 2, not quite, but there's some numerical problem. The box size is not infinitely large. And then the period starts growing as you go to the BCS uh, limit. Uh, so now let's go to the experiment and just do it and just try to see what happens. The way we create the solitons is just exactly the same way as it was uh, done in both Einstein condensates. We pulse an off-resonant laser beam, indeed green, onto half of our cloud. That means over here there is a potential U, given by the AC stark shift of that laser beam, acting on the uh, atoms, since the pairing uh, contains spin up and spin down particles, we get two times that potential. If we are asking now for what the phase will be, it's going to be two times the potential times the time over h bar. That's as simple as it is. And you have to do this rather quickly to really imprint uh, a pi phase shift um, before you excite all kinds of other things and move the cloud away. So, that's, so you have to do this a little bit quickly, but it's not, big, not a big deal. Um, actually, for the maybe maybe it's cute for uh, people in condensed matter. This is roughly like a, um, a two sides of a Josephson junction, where you just apply a different voltage on the two sides, and we know from Josephson that the, that the phase has to advance linearly in time, just like that. So now here's the here's the movie. Um, we shine the light on half of the cloud, and then let's see what happens after some while. You might see hopefully squinting your eyes, that there's a dark shadow moving up and down. That is the soliton. And indeed, this is roughly played back in real time, um, because the period is indeed roughly uh, one second. So these are the frames from the movie, where you see the shadow moving up and down inside our, our cloud. So this is really like a plane propagating through the uh, through the 3D superfluid, and you see here the time scale is seconds. So now, um, uh, I of course must have fooled you, because didn't I tell you that the solitons are almost completely filled as I go to the BCS regime? I did tell you that. So, so why can I even see them? Why do I say that there's the shadow? Well, in fact, we cannot see them by directly imaging our cloud in the strongly directing regime. If you give time of flight to our cloud right on resonance, for example, at the Feshbach resonance, where the interactions are as strong as quantum mechanics allows, we pretty much don't see anything in the, in the profile. What we have to do is we have to ramp, as was done in the case of vortices in the old days, to the BEC regime in time of flight to bring out the solitons. This ramp to the BEC regime uh, takes out the interaction strength, it converts this gas of fermion pairs into a gas of molecules. Well, molecules, a molecular condensate, doesn't want to have filling of its solitons, so the solitons empty out, and the shadow becomes observable within our signal to noise. Right? So it, it starts to grow. If you look at these profiles, we start to see the soliton uh, by, by the bare eye, and we can, of course, take the residuals and see, indeed, there is something. The evolution, of course, can now happen in the strongly directing regime, in the interesting regime, and this is just the imaging technique. 
So we take these images, uh, we can subtract an average version of the cloud itself, and um, then I uh, can just follow the evolution as a function of time. And you see, we get many, many seconds of evolution time uh, before the soliton dies. In fact, it's almost not quite uh, approaching the lifetime of our Fermilux, Fermilux superfluid. So now, big question, what happens as a function of interaction strength? Uh, well, here in the BEC regime at 700 Gauss, uh, you might think we should get like roughly square root of 2. Turns out this is already so strong interacting that we don't. We get like 4.4 times the bare frequency of atoms, which tells us that the um, effective mass enhancement, m star over m, is 4.4 squared, right? So it's already huge and much larger than 2. But by the way, so this is a nice way to actually study strongly interacting both gases, right? You make fermions, pair them up uh, into molecules, and that gives you a strongly interacting both gas. Um, so, yeah, and I should, yeah. <clears throat> Is that what couldn't think of this number as sort of the inverse of the condensed fraction? That's exactly what I hope it, it means. Right. I see. Yeah. Exactly. Like so I'll, I'll how many participate in the condensation, which is a very small fraction in the Right. In the I think that's exactly what this what this is measuring. Um, so so as we now crank up the interactions, we see that the period gets slower and slower. So on resonance it's really, you know, uh, um, quite a bit slow, one second a period or so, even above a second, whereas here it was like a few hundred milliseconds. This all can be, of course, put on a graph, where here you show the period of the soliton normalized by the trapping period, which, by the way, directly, if you square it, gives you the effective mass of the soliton normalized by the bare mass, versus interaction strength, 1 over KFA. And well, uh, these, uh, th this is the curve we measure. The red line is, of course, just a guide to the eye. There is no theory. The theory is down here. That's, that's the result coming from the Bogu of the Gen equation, which gives you m star over m equals 3. So we have roughly 200. That's a big riddle that I invite you to figure out uh, what it is. I love it, of course, because it's always boring if you just are dead on the theory. Here we are quite a factor away, 50 or so, and, um, and that's, of course, more fun. But on the left, you're not superfluid, right? I'm not you're it's always superfluid in the whole thing. On the left? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, we see a soliton to start with. We see the soliton. How do you know it's superfluid? Well, how do you so make the soliton? will tell you that you see the so low. No, 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 no. This, this is, is the B C side. Oh, it's B C side. We have a very hard time going on the, in sorry, the B C S sorry, regime. Sorry. Here, the reason we stop the reason we stop on the B C S side is sorry, that the soliton lives only for one second yeah. or so, so, so roughly for one period. And, um, and as we go further, it lives for less than one period. We can no longer measure a period. So that's why we have to stop there. OK, we can go to um, the more 3D version of this by squeezing our tr cloud, making the aspect ratio, which is uh, on the order of 3, which is more 3D. Uh, that even enhances the effect. Um, as we go to even longer aspect ratio, we, th we seem to be seeing roughly the same effective mass as when we had uh, an aspect ratio of 7 or so. So increasing the aspect ratio by a factor of 2 pretty much doesn't change the result much. So we think that this is roughly the limit that you would get in a very, very, very long uh, cigar. And this discrepancy cannot be explained by dimensionality. Um, how about finite temperature effects? One could say maybe our solitons are filled with uh, thermal um, stuff that's sitting inside the soliton, and that's why it's so heavy. Well, so we check that. Uh, at low temperatures, we see the soliton propagation to be a rather nice, uh, roughly undamped sine wave. And we have a beautiful contrast of the soliton. But at finite temperature, well, we always have finite temperature, as we heat up the system a little bit, uh, we start seeing anti-damping. Now, this is a very, a very beautiful demonstration of having a negative mass particle with some damping. That means it will speed up and it will increase its position. The soliton is, of course, not the ground state of the system, clearly. It's an excited state. And the, more, the faster it is, the closer it gets to the actual ground state of the system. So it reduces its energy by speeding up. So as it gets now some kicks from some phonons that are around, it will actually uh, increase its velocity and go to a larger and larger uh, positions. 
So this immediately tells you, aha, I indeed have a negative mass particle here. By the way, this is all on resin. But, but, but sorry, you could argue that if you were going to the BCS side, you would also get a hotter and hotter. But there you were saying it's doing less. This is all at the same uh, field now. We didn't do the 3D thing. So, I know, so I we know. just went to 832 and looked at uh, the, the effect of temperature there. And there we see the period actually doesn't change much. But you do start to see this no, enter But as mm -hmm. you were pushing to the BCS side, you said you had to stop because life the solid time became short. Mm -hmm. But there, in principle, I could also say, like here, you were just dropping TC, yeah. you were increasing T over TC, yeah. and you were seeing the opposite of this. Opposite? Sorry. No, no. Life. The, don't confuse lifetime of the solid ton with the with the anti damping time. Okay. That's not what I meant. With lifetime. Lifetime is this. Okay. This is when we get quite hot. Uh, the okay, okay. solid ton positions become much less reproducible from shot to shot. Um, it seems to die. I mean, over here we still see like. Okay. Glitches, so but we cannot. Ratio of contrast versus amplitude Right. So we, we here we still see lots of like fluctuations, so but we cannot. This huh? one's above TC. No, no, none of this is can be possibly above TC as long as we still see something like a, a deterministic propagation of the soliton, because otherwise I wouldn't actually have a phase but to but talk have about. You, have you done experiment about TC to see what you see? Well, uh, no. This is so far below TC. That I mean, you would see nothing. I can show you in a second. The thermal fraction here is already is, is very very small. We have only like 20 percent. Even here, only 20 percent of the gas is actually thermal. Uh, if you start getting like more than that, you don't see any soliton. It's terrible. Uh, but you do see at higher temperature in the images more and more of these fluctuations. What, what, what exactly is that temperature there? <laughs> That's a very good question. Yeah. Uh, to uh, so you might think now we have this wonderful equation of state, so we can know like every temperature ever. So this is actually all below 0.05 T Fermi, 5% of the Fermi temperature, and we cannot measure the difference between that and that. So uh, what we have to do is we do the rapid ramp to the BEC side, uh, where the condensates become, stay small because it has now a smaller direction strength, and the thermals fly off fast. So then we can actually fit a thermal uh, fraction to the gas, and that's our thermometer. Oh. Uncalibrated thermometer, but at least it gives us an, an idea of the temperature. Oh, there's no direct measurement of the... It's tough. It's tough. I mean, at point of 0.05 and below, every noise in your image will actually perturb your measurement you of see, the you temperature. You remember that John Thomas, the famous experiment that he, he, he saw an isotopic expansion about TC. So the, 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 there are certain aspects of, 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 of hydrodynamics of the strong act that, 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 that go across TC. Mm -hmm. But this is like, TC is 0.17. Okay. We are below 0.05. Okay. Okay. And that we can show by fitting. Mm -hmm. But we cannot distinguish 0.02 from 0.04 from 0.06. Right? So that's why we have to use the thermal fraction in these images. You can almost not see there is actually a thermal fraction here, but the contrast doesn't bring that out. Uh, surrounding this bright yellow stuff, there is, there is a thermal stuff, and there's some bimodality that we can fit. That's what we use to say what the temperature is. OK, so it, it seems to die faster. Uh, and we have these ripples that are appearing in these images. In addition to the soliton that we make, we think these might be thermal solitons. Uh, in a quasi-1D regime, you might expect those. But I mean, I don't want to claim this is the proof of it. But it's like, it could be that just thermally excited thermal solitons might pop up out of nowhere, then collide with our soliton and uh, kill each other. So, so this is summarizing now the findings from these finite temperature experiments. Again, we plot it as a function of thermal fraction, not of temperature. We have no way to get that, uh, but of thermal fraction in these images. The period is uh, pretty much always <coughs> constant, which tells us the period should really be a quantum effect, so the effective mass should be a quantum effect. However, the anti-damping time goes, of course, dramatically down as you increase the temperature, and the lifetime goes dramatically down as you increase the temperature. Let me give you um, an idea of what might be the what might be going on with this huge discrepancy between the Bohr of Dijen mean field theory and what we observe. There is a an experiment that allows us to gain intuition: the dark bright soliton experiment, where you have a spin impurity uh, that loves to sit inside a soliton uh, in the Bose-Einstein condensate. 
So you can have, for example, spin, one, spin down bosons living in a spin up Bose condensate. They will love to sit here because of the repulsive interactions. There it was seen that the period of the soliton motion increases tremendously because of these impurities. Um, you can describe this beautifully by coupled equations that Bush and England uh, uh, showed in this paper. Uh, and indeed, the period goes down as ex uh, the period increases as expected. Uh, now, what about a weakly interacting Bose gas? There, people write down the Gospodarski equation. They write down also what happens to the fluctuations on top of the Bose condensate. They do see that indeed fluctuations, quantum fluctuations, love to sit inside the soliton. But what's missing is a back action of those fluctuations onto the condensate itself. So that's what we need, I think, to get away from the square root of 2 result for the period that happens in these both condensate. So what I think is what we might have is a lot of non-condensed bosons, um, probably in addition to Andreev states, but probably most of the stuff that we see is non-condensed bosons that are living there. So these solitons already in strongly interacting BECs will be filled with these uncondensed bosons and make it really heavy. That's what we will think might be happening. Um, uh, one caveat, uh, why is this mean field theory so bad? Because the uncondensed fraction, which should be going like square root of n cubed, that's the Lee Young result, uh, is, uh, comes out very incorrectly if you use Bogiev de Gen theory on, uh, for the strongly interacting Bose gas. Um, there it comes out to be n cubed, which is of course wrong. So we have to fix this right? uh, to, to uh, get a good estimate of the uncondensed fraction. Just to, to show and tell in, 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 in half a minute, you can make the gas more 3D, then you start seeing the uh, snake instabilities that are expected for solitons in three dimensions. The, the solitonic plane is just not perfectly stable, so it starts to wiggle and we see that. Um, you can make two solitons, why not? Um, and you can also, this is super preliminary last week, uh, make them collide and have go through each other. Okay, this is very preliminary. But your, your, your imagination tells you, okay, so there are these two guys and they go through. Uh, this is a crazily difficult experiment, okay? So, so uh, apologies for not having perfect data on this yet. But this, this is really an, an interesting system, I think, to tell us more about non-equilibrium physics uh, beyond mean field physics in these uh, strongly directing gases. And um, what I hope is that this is also the entrance for um, the full de Ferrell lacken of Chinnikov phase in cold gases. I have to say this for one second. I was interrupted. So I, I need this one slide here to show why solitons are the first other limit of FFLO. You have a gap here in the homogeneous case. And adding one impurity atom means it will cost one gap energy. Okay, So it has to sit on top of the superfluid. Now, if you make a soliton instead, uh, we have seen, OK, there's this uh, effective potential for these quasar particles. There will be these impurities localized in the soliton. How much energy does that cost? Well, it could be the lost pairing energy, delta squared over E Fermi times the density of particles, times the width of the soliton. Turns out that's also given by the pairing gap, but the prefactor is 2 over pi j. So it's smaller than 1. So that means. It is, it is energetically favorable in quasi-1D to make a soliton, put an impurity guy in there, instead of having it live on top of a homogeneous superfluid. So, so that might uh, be what we hopefully can observe with imbalance. We might see that there are imbalanced particles sitting inside the soliton. We can hope to make many of them. That's a soliton lettuce. And then in the limit of many, many solitons, this gets into the Larkin of Chinnikov phase. I'm so done. I'm so sorry for your long attention, but uh, this is my wonderful group uh, over at MIT. You're welcome to check it out, by the way, and thanks for your attention. Are there any more questions for Martin? Yes. So in, in two dimensions, so, so what is known is that the snake instabilities, they, there's a huge body of numerical work. The snake instabilities, they, they produce cadets of Petrushvili solitons. They, 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 they produce? Cadets of Petrushvili solitons, they, 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 they live, yeah, they live on, I mean, those are extensions of the, of the continent degrees. So, uh, basically, very much the, the degenerate uh, vortex, uh, vortex pairs. So, mm -hmm. so did, you, did you see any, your snake instabilities, do they shoot out anything? So we sometimes see as a remnant of the soliton creation business, 
uh, a single vortex of yeah. sometimes two indeed. <laughs> okay. But it's very you know random and fluctuating, so we don't have statistics on this. But we see sometimes one or two vortices pop up uh, instead of the solitons. So maybe there is this instability that we are seeing. And, and, and with, the, with the effective mass, you have any kind of a mass uh, or of a mass equivalence if you apply a uniform field instead of a harmonic trap. Will we see the same effective mass in acceleration? We should actually do that experiment. That's a wonderful yeah, because, because it's a thing to do. Definition of the effective mass. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, that would be very cute to do. <coughs> can, can you, could you interpret your anti-damping uh, phenomena as a dynamical instability? That is to say, you bump energy from somewhere else. By right. So, so, so the picture is that phonons that can, of course, propagate this quasi-1D um, uh, superfluid, they scatter off the soliton, giving it a kick, and uh, so it speeds up, and, and that's what makes it anti-damp. Exactly. So it should be the phonon scattering in this quasi-1D regime. There was one more question. Yeah. Uh, um, maybe it's uh, related to the so can we, can, we, can we separate the effect of effective mass from the force constant? Uh, it's possible just because the force constant gets weaker, uh, but the effective mass is not much larger. Ah, so uh, you're, you're saying that um, something about can we, can yeah, we separate the, the effective mass? Is, uh, hmm? m omega squared. Uh, right. right. So it's possible the force constant that gets weaker, ah. uh, but not the effective mass gets larger. So, so you're very right. What I think is happening is that the effective mass m star that I was discussing, that is always roughly given by the total number of atoms that, that can sit within a healing link of this soliton. So it's roughly always the same, maybe with some prefactor. But the bare mass, which is giving you the force, that is going down because less and less uh, particles are missing inside the soliton. So that's, I think, what's, mis what's happening. We, of course, don't measure independently m star and m. We only measure the ratio. But I think what's happening is exactly what you say, that because less and less solitons are missing inside the soliton, uh, less and less atoms are missing inside the soliton, therefore the effective force is down. And so you get a much weaker restoring force.